Good afternoon, all, as Dr. Leila has said, I'm not here, and I'm moderator for this insightful session. As a research associate at the Research Development Office of MNU, I'm excited to facilitate a meaningful conversation on how research institutions, universities, and other non governmental organizations can play an important role in disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Um, the purpose of this panel discussion, and actually the purpose of this dialogue, is um, what? to understand and to explore um, what kind of involvement as NGOs, as government, as academic universities, institutions, collaboratively and part, uh, as partners, we can work together um, to for a successful path to CCA. So, um, in the past panel discussions and in presentations, we have seen that. Um, the uh, understanding the disaster, disasters and forecasting, the most important thing is to be prepared. So uh, the main objective of this panel discussion is how we as these institutions collaboratively work together in order to disseminate this information and be prepared. So I will not take much of your time. I would give the floor to the panel members and, we, and I would like to introduce the panel uh, you could introduce yourself to our audience and to the online members and give a brief introduction of how you contribute to this form. So I would like to give the floor to Dr. Hi, my name is Dinia. Um, I serve as an assistant professor in the Department of Environment and Natural Sciences. And uh, so my background is in micro microbiology and public health. Um, and also I teach uh, biology and microbiology courses. And in addition to this, um, I'm currently teaching a uh, master's of uh, science in geospatial technology uh, for disaster management. So I teach uh, research, advanced research methodology. And also currently I'm the module uh, dissertation leader for this uh, um, dissertation leader for this um, Course on uh, geospatial technologies for disaster management. And my interest is uh, research interest is in uh, public health and climate change. Um, so I'm really happy to join the session. And um, I hope to have a very interesting and interactive session. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Martin Masih. Um, I'm from the Model Space Research Organization. Um, I'm the president of the organization. We're a fairly young organization. Um, my background is in space, because the space research organization. I'm the first Mobian who went to the International Space University. Um, but on top of that, I, I also have a background in data and intelligence. Uh, and so marrying them together gives uh, me a very um, useful insight into how can we use space to deliver intelligence to the right people at the right time, the right moment. Um, at Mesro, since our inception um, just a year and uh, a few months ago, we have been working with multiple institutions, uh, even reaching out to institutions like India, um, on trying to work on early warning disasters towards climate change adaptation. Um, Mesro has been working with uh, a lot of space uh, partners, such as high resolution imagery providers, uh, space application providers, um, across various types of sensors and use cases. We are trying to um, not just provide to the mobile population, but understand what is the right um, type of applications we need in the right format to the right user. Because we're trying to bridge the gap between the technology, the data, and, and the actual use of it. Uh, and so I think this panel and this uh, workshop is really useful. Um, I'm really happy that you know, Skip and um, all the participants here have been contributing to this, and we're hoping to play a pivotal role in trying to bridge that gap between. Um, space technologies and uh, all the uh, I, this one. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Maid. I work for um, an organization called EcoCare Motives. Um, EcoCare Motives um, uh, was formally registered in 1994. So we're one of the oldest environmental organizations in the country. We worked on conservation, climate uh, education, climate uh, advocacy. Uh, uh, policy advocacy on different related, uh, different uh, related environmental issues. Um, personally, I've been involved with uh, the disaster risk management sector for some time. 
Um, I work for I work for UNICEF on the Law and Resilient Climate Resilient Development Project. I work with uh, NDMA, um, uh, well, partly managing some of their programs. I work for the Red Crescent, um, and, and, and and recently I just completed a, um, a an employment contract with UNICEF as a climate resilience uh, consultant. So now I work uh, full time on uh, environmental and climate change issues with Fiscal Society with Eco uh, and uh, most of what we're seeing is that there needs to be changes in policy landscape around how we deal with climate change, how we deal with adaptation, and, and how we could um, really look towards um, creating a resilient mode. A lot of work needs to be done on that uh, area. And I think civil society can be an extremely important partner for this uh, process. Hello, everyone. My name is Uman. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive at the National Disaster Management Authority. Um, the NDMA, as you would know, would be the primary government agency for disaster risk reduction, uh, preparedness, response, and recovery. So we have that very unique space where we, we get to uh, work a lot uh, at the community level with the local local level governments. We, we get to uh, do preparedness, risk, redu uh, risk reduction, and response works at the, at the apex level in terms of national level coordination. Um, and also we get to balance however difficult it is, um, balance the work that we do on response and also on policy programmatic areas around disaster reduction and preparedness. Okay. Thanks for that. You kind of feel that as you know who's turning. No, I actually want to say. So, hi everybody. I think I've said my name enough in the past few days. <laughs> so, my name is Leila Salapur. I'm an Associate Economic Affairs Officer. Uh, I work for uh, SCAP South South the State Office from New Delhi. So, we cover actually 10 countries. And um, the work that we did for this project uh, was a collaboration between our office as well as uh, IPD. Uh, the disaster risk management uh, basically section uh, of uh, the Bangkok uh, office that works technically uh, and in a very kind of uh, concentrated way on disaster risk management uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, so we are, you know, that outsider that uh, here is there's a need for help uh, to kind of assist uh, on the sidelines um, and uh, partners with the local agencies to help with different aspects of sustainable development. Um, because uh, again, from the perspective of, I guess, uh, United Nations and SCAP, uh, we think about like development and growth as a whole. So it's not only like one you know, disaster, it's not, things are not separated. They are one body together. Development is very, very important. Urbanization, like it's, serious, uh, it's a serious matter. Quality is important. And every one of the goals that are out there are connected to each other. And uh, I think one of the most important goals that SCAP is built on is goal 17, which is partnership. Uh, and one of the reasons that, as I mentioned before, I kind of really wanted to have this session to talk about how we can uh, build on whatever has been done so far moving forward from this project. Thank you so much for your uh, very well comprehensive introduction. Um, now, uh, I would like to target my question to Mr. Omar and uh, Mr. Martin. Uh, if you could share us uh, some examples of how your agency has collaborated with other agencies towards the board, some examples of what both you have done so far and how you have contributed. My disclosure to be um, so, so we we began our collaboration efforts um, quite recently, and so it is a lot of these are ongoing. Um, but primarily, from the perspective of disaster research, um, one of our key objectives has been understanding the landscape of what is available internationally um, from the space community that we can leverage. So a very good example is um, the international chapter on space and major disasters. Um, what they allow us to do is so what, what we were surprised by is Moses is not a signatory to the charter, but we definitely need to be signatory to the charter. Uh, and the way the charter works is when we do have a disaster, 
within hours to um, within the shortest possible response time, they will mobilize the resources of the major space actors that have contributed to the charter to, for the purpose of monitoring and, and managing the disaster. And so what we are trying to do is we're working with these international um, charters and agencies to best figure out how can we work with local entities and, and bring these to the designated authorities like the UK. Um, and uh, in, in our case, a lot of these also fall under the purview of the Ministry of Defense or the um, DMNDF. Um, on top of that, we also work very closely with the Ministry of Environment um, on, on specific use cases around earth observation, climate change adaptation primarily. Um, so, for example, we're currently working with them trying to understand how can we assist the ministry's efforts to show that country um, on understanding um, the change of the vegetation cover, for example, in these islands, because all of these could matter in the long run as well. Um, recently, um, through a collaboration with the Ministry of Environment on their Ocean Act, we also uh, demonstrated the, the, the potential of using special types of satellite sensors like radar sensors to detect how the uh, Maldivian Islands move work. So we, we've, we've always seen um, efforts to track how the shoreline receives um, horizontally. But with these technologies, we're able to um, see a very sensitive level of how the land is shifting. And what that means is that when we when we are able to provide this to decision-making authorities such as the AMA, they'll be able to build better models and understanding which areas are most vulnerable, uh, which areas are most flood prone. So these are some of the ways in which we can start to engage with that. Thank you. Yeah, um, we have a question from the um, one of the points by Barney. Um, yeah, I don't think we are part of the charter, but there are other, you know, disaster management initiatives that we definitely could uh, work with you more uh, to liberalize on. Uh, one thing that I would recall is Sentinel Asia project, where they would also provide uh, satellite space imagery for disaster management projects. So, I think it's also through the Asian Disaster Reduction Center in Japan. And so we could definitely um, have more discussions around that area. In terms of um, the, the work of NDMA and, and um, how do we partner with CEOs so and uh, other, other governmental bodies, um, NDMA is also a fairly new organization. Um, uh, for the better part of our existence, we did tsunami recovery work and we only started doing. Um, you know, full spectrum disaster management related work since uh, 2012 onwards. Uh, since then, uh, I think we've, we've made uh, uh, good progress on um, on discussions and thematic uh, uh, program work around you know uh, disaster risk reduction preparedness. Our main area of work uh, with CSOs has been around you know awareness. Um, capacity building with regard to disaster risk reduction um, preparedness, um, and some and and um, when when there is a crisis situation, we also uh, look for partners um, for you know emergency response and how do we make our response efforts as efficient as 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 it could to reach out to the marginalized pockets of people in the community. For example, our partnership with the model and the is going very strong where we rely on them uh, to provide emergency response uh, recovery support to um, hard to reach vulnerable populations in the country. A good example would be the migrant population living across the borders, especially in Barnet, uh, where you know if a government body um, or a first responder in a uniform goes up to their doctors, they would immediately you know uh, would, would want to you know. Uh, uh, you know, safeguard uh, whatever their status is. But if we go through uh, to these pockets of people through an organization solely focused on humanitarian response, like the modular uh, repression, we do tend to ensure that we don't leave any person behind uh, when there is a crisis when people are in need. We do the same. Uh, but not as efficiently as we, we want to through, you know, other organizations like, you know, um, uh, disability related organizations like the more social design um, society where we, we try to, you know, uh, maximize our awareness um, efforts so that, you know, we do engage with, with um, 
with other uh, uh, groups that would require a special attention. Um, in terms of you know uh, doing partner work uh, on disaster reduction, um, you know even though we are very small, we do try and see how we could uh, potentially advocate for the work done by other organizations as much as we could. We uh, during the short time with uh, uh, Mesra also we we try to uh, reach that gap through you know policy level discussions on on how the value addition. An organization like Mesro could, could bring to the table, and in terms of other uh, through even organizations, we've also managed to work with you know the, the, the local scout groups, girl guides, and the cadet for as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Okay, so it's not only a session where I ask questions and the panel members give information, it's a bunch of uh, interactive session. We would like questions from your side as well. I'm sure you will have a lot of questions, and for the online members, you can send the questions in the text. Um, so, uh, what um, Mr. Martin has said that uh, the information that you collect, the information that you retrieve. Uh, actually, uh, the local council authorities who claim the land claim, land claim which is uh, like the information which you have mentioned, is very important for, for the land history. So, do you actually relay this information or uh, communicate with them? Because when they do the land claim, they detect the zone for agricultural sector for the tourism activity they are developing. So, do you really relay this information to these or do they push to you? How, how do you collaborate with each other? Working to ensure that there is less risk and less close to the to the, to the island community. Um, yeah, so we started our um, organization's efforts to understand the local needs really at a council level because the councils are the ones that are directly um, interested in these issues. They are the, the first line of um, uh, decision makers that, that really have to make these decisions on an island. Uh, and so currently we are engaging with um, councils, um, island and at all level, and we've been gathering a lot of requirements um, on these island uh, at all councils. Some councils are very forward thinking, they're very supportive and they're very engaged and we really hope to be able to pilot some of these exactly like you mentioned, um, being able to use these satellite imagery in recent ones to compare whether there's adherence to the land use plan or is there a need for land use plans to be um, amended. And so we're hoping that in the, in the next couple of months, um, when we have our conference here, we'll actually demonstrate some of these and through work with uh, certain councils that are more willing to um, um, take the initiative, we should be able to convince the other councils that there is a lot of value in, in using these types of technologies. Um, uh, you have mentioned you have been collaboratively working with the local council and recently we have been hearing that some of the islands are taken for the agricultural purpose. So do you, like, do they compose with you or collect information from your site for they to do these infrastructure developments and carry out these activities in these uninvited islands? Uh, not at the moment. So that is definitely a gap that we have been trying to address and we would like to be able to address them more. Um, we do think that there's a huge need and scope, um, especially in the first case that you mentioned, in these um, EI related work that could be utilized in Mr. Mike, would you like to say something on that regarding the advocacy work done in relation to this? Um, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, what, when we look at existing climate adaptation and, and disaster risk uh, reduction, uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's very important to make um, good policy decisions around the, around the, how we go about this. As of now, the moment does not have uh, uh, a long term climate adaptation plan uh, that, that can really try to address um, issues like uh, possible climate induced migration, for example. So, these are issues that it's difficult to have conversations around, um, connected to land rights, connected to intrinsic uh, uh, connections to your own on, on islands. Uh, we have started to build a uh, mega urban settlement in the Greater Mali area which does not really reflect um, a nationwide development uh, uh, goal, but rather centralization uh, of, of a lot of resources and services. Um, the motives is by its natural design, um, is 
very independent small islands that uh, make up uh, uh, institutional governance for people. And there's been effort over the years to decentralize the motives. And I think that's one of the, um, uh, there are successes and there are bad days when it comes to how we go about it. But long term climate reflection does not really understand the current type of decentralization the motives is, is going forward with. Long term adaptation requires resilient island infrastructures where people could build a safe future. And, and we don't see motives talking about mm -hmm. these uh, the, uh, bigger policy decisions. What we're talking about is identifying 50 or so safe, resilient communities that we could potentially build resilient, safe motives. We cannot keep wasting resources on 186 islands. And when I say this, it, it becomes challenging because. I do understand how important um, uh, every individual and the sense of belonging to his community is. Therefore, I don't encourage forced migration, but what I'm talking about is safe, resilient communities where people could really voluntarily move to adapt. And climate and adaptation and disaster preparedness for the moment is about long term safe, resilient communities and islands. And for that, a lot of policy dialogue needs to happen. Our economy is, is the same a situation where we have. And the dependency on tourism sector for a long, long time. And when we talk about climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction, again, our long-term strategy of how we are economizing on tourism sector does not um, is not adaptable uh, for the long term. We have to diversify our economy, and we need to start having those conversations about real uh, economic uh, uh, initiatives that we could start now, so that in the next 20 years we would have alternative economy very close as a so a lot of that depends for me um, uh, on, on how uh, visionary governments are and how policy uh, can be more resilient and, and, and more um, uh, uh, forward thinking. There are extreme challenges. There will be extreme challenges in going forward with both of what I just proposed because it is connected with local councils, connected with individuals, connected with uh, the gravestone of your parents in your island. It's connected with the coconut farms that your family owns over years. Is connected to intrinsic identity of local motivations, and adaptation does not unfortunately recognize all of that um, uh, when we go about it. So it's going to be challenging, it's going to be hard. That was a lot that may not have really answered your question, but I think that's my take. Thank you, Wayne. Um, sure, actually, when we speak about resilience and resilience, it comes to our minds for the climate sector. But Let's focus on the agricultural sector. It involves like majority of the communities, island communities. They are uh, we have family farming communities. We have seen in outbreak of the COVID-19 how it has affected us, closing the border, closing of the border, and then uh, we have to uh, the farmers who left their fields burned. They have to go and pick up the straw and start farming. So. Uh, we can see from these data and from these gadgets and tools uh, in the in the next 20 or 30 years what we'll be facing. Yet our policies and our initiatives are not focusing on the resilience of the farming community because food and nutrition security is one thing we should focus not only the tourism sector. So um, moving ahead, I would like to ask our panel members. Uh, what are the gaps and challenges um, you have identified in collaboration as well as bringing DCA and DRR into your projects? Uh, there may be projects there might be. I'm definitely uh, confident enough to say that you'll be getting a lot of projects. So what are the what are the challenges that you as a um, as your uh, institutes have faced in uh, implementing these uh, projects uh, to better these objectives for the today? Maybe they start from the first person yeah. start. I think uh, because I uh, represent human models national university as a national university, I think it's uh, it's very important uh, because uh, we are the people who are trained the future uh, experts, right? Uh, leaders of these kind of issues. So, um, so in my department, uh, we are uh, we we are training um, uh, environmental. And um, so, environmental as well as science based courses, right? And um, so, we have recently um, launched a new course on climate change, digital science and climate change. And um, so, I think uh, the way forward from, from our side is to 
um, you know, train more people uh, and uh, uh, the, the, some of the challenges we are facing is uh, uh, the students. Um, so we need to, we need to, uh, in order to, um, you know, to deal with all these issues, uh, we need people who are trained in this area. So I think that there is a big gap in terms of uh, that flex in um, having uh, human resources in this. So I think that's, the, that's one issue we have. And then um, that's how we can do it. So I think um, with our new courses, we are hoping um, to, you know, to, uh, to train uh, future leaders in climate uh, climate related issues, and uh, and then um, have master's level course at the moment, uh, which is specifically focusing on um, disaster management uh, using uh, geospatial technologies. So I think these two courses specifically will also contribute a lot. And um, and the other other issue we have is our capacity increase. So um, that's something we need to um, uh, we need to really build up on. Um, so I think the way to go about it is to um, collaborate with um, closely with uh, um, um, different stakeholders, government, NGOs. Uh, so I think it's it's really really important. And also, um, 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 also to 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 make sure that our, we are doing the relevant research, and the research is also um, contributing to the policy. So I think that's uh, you know from um, as an educational student, that's what we can do. Um, so I'll let you continue. Um, I think there are two main challenges that we've um, identified. Um, one is there is a, is a perception issue by being a, a non-governmental organization that somehow um, there's only a certain box in which we can pray for certain things. Um, and then, so we, we've been actively trying to um, change that perspective by proactively building institutions and communicating these as well. So that is definitely an issue we've had with um, working with some of the uh, social government agencies, but not that they have um, not provided us the time and attention, but I think there is a preconceived notion that FNGO, you know, NGOs are generally very good. Um, the other issue that we identified is that it is, it is generally very difficult to understand uh, or, uh, where the different initiatives are being mapped out, which entities are involved. Uh, we would usually hear that there is, for example, a World Bank show on this project, but it's very hard for us to understand how is it getting disseminated. So um, we, we put in a lot of practical effort in communicating with concerns and queries to what we esteem are the relevant authorities, and we do end up finding um, some of this information. But I do think that um, those two things have been generally um, Development has, in the modest been always, um, for me, very complicated. Um, it's either the government would like to have something implemented for the people, or the people would like something implemented for them that the government really doesn't really want to implement. It could also be something that um, an evaluation or feasibility study says not possible that the people want. And then you'd have to ultimately come up with these development projects based on um, how the politics move around things. Um, what then happens is that there are plans that could help mitigate environmental loss, for example, that very much is tied to how I can space disasters. Um, so disaster uh, preparedness incorporated into a lot of this planning becomes afterthought when we implement projects. So for example, an EIA evaluator goes to an island and does a project feasibility um, and says, my God, you cannot build your harbor here because this is definitely not what your island dynamic is about. Um, but you need this harbor to be on the western side of your island. So this is more practical for, for your community, uh, more practical for your environmental uh, and, and disaster preparedness and mitigation efforts. Ultimately, what Guess decided is that the hour needs to be close to our home, it needs to be close to where people could bring this, and that may not be always the best choice when it comes to how the island dynamics work. And thus, you end up with a harbor that you build um, that has not really taken account the environmental loss, the fact that there are disaster risk mitigation measures, and ultimately, it's what the people want, and that's just what the, what the government wants. And then down the line in four years, you need to build a new harbor because your harbor is not working for you, or the environment doesn't support that harbor, and because there's so much flooding that has happened over the, 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 the 
surges has increased because of how you've put your postal uh, modification measures there. The, the story goes on, road development, whatever it is. So a lot of this is uh, development is not really connected to what is uh, islands, what is geography, and what the environment is talking about. It has led to uh, close to millions of losses when it comes to damages due to a, a, a sudden onset event that could create, that could cause uh, uh, flooding or, or something like that. And then you hear these stories from different, uh, uh, different urban, urbanizing islands right now. So the challenge remains that when civil society really comments on these EIAs, when civil society really wants to engage on these subjects, it's always going to be an afterthought because civil society does not really matter. What matters is how the government has made a pledge. Uh, what matters is how the people have, have wanted that project to be. And, and that Entirely, at the end of the day, it comes to it, um, how much um, conscious we are as, as Maldivians, how educated we are, and how willing we are to understand our ecosystem and thrive and live there. The Maldives uh, is one of the only countries in the Asia Pacific region for 40 years we mandated a subject called environmental studies in our primary education. Why hasn't um, social behavioral change and climate and environmental conscious not being built? Because we stopped at primary. There's no climate education, environment education in your tertiary, our tertiary education, not mandatory in any of our other uh, degree programs that you go into unless you specifically study an environment course. So yes, the foundations is good, but is that enough for us to have our communities, our young people more conscious about environment that could bring about positive conscious about environment, understand the ecosystem, build a more uh, appropriate connection to you, to, to, to the ecosystem that surrounds your island. There needs to be done, there needs to be again a lot more done. Um, so yes, I think there is a lack of general uh, consciousness. You may have the awareness, you know what a plastic bag would do to your reef. Um, that is awareness, but consciously social behavioral change that follows with it. Does that really, do we see that happening in our communities? When politicians come up and decide uh, when you decide that you make a land reclamation to happen, how conscious are you about what would this mean to the overall safeguard of your community and protection measures that could come along with it? Why are people not interested to live on stills when resorts have successfully built still uh, over water structures and been living there for over 30 years in these models? And structural integrity remains as good, but we haven't had uh, an initiative in any of the islands where people would like to do an alternative project island living on stills. Why not? Why are we not being innovative enough? Why is our creative minds not coming up with innovative climate solutions for reclamation? We opt to do the impossible rather than what's possible. Promoting, for example, is something that's new, something that doesn't have the uh, technology proven across the world, but still people do live on stills. I would, I would guess they pay over a thousand dollars for a night on these stills. And these structures have remained intact for over 30 years. I mean, we are art, architects, we have engineers. It's about the will and, and the change in mindset that could also bring about better patients at the end of the day. By the time I got the raccoon, I been thinking about saying two things. Uh, one, I think um, Dr. Nadi also invited about agriculture, and I think it's worthwhile to highlight how important agriculture is for islands and communities. So we are we are very familiar with the with the statement that one percent of the Maldives is then ninety nine percent of what we have in water. Do you know how much of that one person is elevated for agriculture? Give me a number. Ten. Five. Twenty. So twenty one. Uh, twenty five percent of that one person is elevated for agriculture, both commercial and in the office. So it's a it's a generalized number, but we could say 25% of the 1% of land that we have, uh, we, we are utilizing uh, their for agriculture. So that is how important agriculture is, even though it does not 
so much when we talk about GDPs, dollars that it brings in, in, into the country in terms of sustenance and in terms of livelihoods. Um, agriculture is one of the key activities that is still undertaken at either level. Every time there is a flooding, um, majority of the island level agricultural uh, fields, plotlands get damaged uh, by excessive rain or by uh, wave based activity that would uh, uh, cause salt water intrusion um, to, the, to the farming areas. Majority of the people that would do farming at island level would be uh, a single parent headed household, majority of them would be a woman headed household. Low income families or families that depend um, um, on agriculture is, is, is the secondary source of income for the family. So every time there is a flood, every time there is a wave based activity that causes damage at um, residential level, you know, the savings, the income of these families are getting eroded away. It's just not household damage that uh, that uh, that is incurred. It is also the long term loss of losing those crops and and the income that they would bring into the family in the short term. The income if they lose it, that would mean their nutrition level might go down. Their you know uh, their education uh, might be affected. Or overall, the social economic status of the family would be affected. We know from studies, you know, when we talked about disasters, we are very slow to talk about it also now it causes this much damage. 450 million uh, USD worth uh, um, damages to the Maldivian economy. If we add all these small events in the 10 year or 15 year period, um, we would almost have um, an equivalent amount of damages that would be comparable to this one. So we might not see it every every year in and now, but those little high frequency low impact events are causing substantial damage in the long run. Um, that is at residential, and the same goes for our public infrastructure. Every time there is a flooding, every time there is you know half paid development activities, we know from experience. Um, every time there's a there's an airport that is being built, the island would have flooding in the coming monsoon seasons. A good example would be Tati uh, The island did not have much uh, flooding activities before the airport was built on 2013. And since 2013, we've been responsible to the uh, island every year or so. Uh, in Timarpuji, in 2015 and 2016 causes a million rupee worth of damages in the monsoon season. A good example would be in terms of reclamation, Dalu Gidu, where you know the island did not report any study before the island was reclaimed to revise its central uh, size. And every every monsoon season afterwards, the island more or less have, have had study. So this erodes away not only residential damage. It also erodes away public infrastructure where B S taxpayer has made um, considerable investment to build roads, to build desalination plants, to build sewage systems where we would need to maintain it in the more. And we know um, for the past five, five years, the number of events um, that has occurred is, is increasing the damages that caused by these events has increased. So that's the reality, that's the ground reality in the Maldives. How are we going to incorporate this into our projects? We are very fluent to talk about hard engineering measures. We need more boulder rocks to protect you know, wave based activities. We need better roads, drainages uh, to, to prevent the, the next flood that, that is going to happen. Um, but I would like to go, uh, I would like you all to come back to me, come, come, come with me to 2011. We did a study in 2011 sanctioned by the government of Maldives. The study was done by UNDP Maldives. that took, looked at cost benefit analysis of disaster risk reduction measures in the country. The, conclusive, uh, the conclusion of the report was that um, we could spend millions on hard infrastructure, but 
at the end of the day, if we don't balance it with softer measures, there won't be a return in investment. So, in, as much as we do hard in hard uh, infrastructure development measures, we would also need to look at building softer skills in 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 island communities so that they are better resilient to future scenarios. How do we ensure that you know uh, island communities? are prepared to respond to the next flooding, flooding situation, how they are able to respond to, you know, high level of beach erosion, which we now we, talk, we, we tell to everyone that 80% of all of our inhabited islands are being eroded away. So how do we ensure that, you know, local communities has the knowledge and has the practice to take care of their beaches, to nourish their beaches and to, to take care of the beach vegetation so that, you know, erosion could be limited. So for us, I think for the civil society and for the government also, we would need to focus on building those of the measures and empowering island communities to understand these of the measures is equally important as the hard, hard engineering measure that is already going on. Okay. Um... <laughs> it doesn't feel any like I don't know um, kind of questions. Um, I'm making question myself whether it's actually working or. Um, I want to change the gear a little bit uh, because again, like from our perspective, it goes more into uh, more regional, international partnership, uh, both domestically and um, you know uh, sub regionally, regionally. So in many fronts, actually, Maldives outside this project has a lot of good partnerships. Uh, I think it's a very active country when you're looking at many relevant uh, regional, sub-regional kind of platforms. Just existence of Rhymes, uh, which is a regional obesity body, and it has an office inside the uh, Maldives Meteorological Service, uh, is by itself kind of a good indicator that there are a lot of work that uh, has been done. But I just want to give you two, three stories about like very, very kind of small stories about this project and how kind of uh, partnership here um, related to DRR, related to work towards uh, basically making this project work uh, really came into the picture. So the budget that the staff have for this project is very small. Like compared to a lot of other things that you see related to infrastructure or development, because it was a data of work. Uh, we didn't have that much budget, whether for capacity building or um, even creating the data. So we had to be very creative because we had like a really, really kind of uh, big ambition uh, in collaboration with the NDMA. We want to, you know, make this really amazing risk profile. So when the first round of the study came, we used the basically conventional kind of regional uh, methods of um, risk projection to basically see what's the um, hazard projection for Maldives and in the first stakeholder consultation uh, a very first thing that came about was you know these islands in Mali are so small that with this 100 and 100 resolution you literally get like three atolls in one projection unit and it's like so kind of high bob and uh, so macro that it doesn't really give any information in terms of planning and that doesn't work like we need something that is a bit more localized so then we were like okay let, let us look into that right so we went and there was no model no downscale model for this kind of studies of course climate change doesn't change as much when you downscale but still there might be some differences uh, that helps basically knowing that helps with uh, programming planning so uh, it was like, okay, what should we do? We tried to like come up with something ourselves. Uh, our uh, consultants, uh, all the specialists are working on some models, um, not as successful. So we got in touch with a few of our partners that have worked on climate change topic. So EPIFLAF was this research institution in Japan. Uh, those that were in their workshop earlier, this, uh, you saw that they're huge. So they helped us uh, come up with a model, downscale model, they should know that actually this is the first of its own uh, in the world uh, that is known at least. There might be some research institutions that privately work on this type of downscale data, but this is not something that you can see anywhere else. 
Um, and you know, we didn't have money to hire them, like they, they get paid, but they agreed for the sake of partnership and it was like such an interesting topic for them that they were like, okay, for this first project, we do it, you know, uh, for free as a partnership kind of collaboration. So we did the work, it got so, uh, so much interest from international communities that the project is being done in Bhutan right now. I'm sure there are a lot of institutions that have started looking at the same type of work in, um, you know, for different countries, for different models. Uh, and this was something that was done just through the partnership that was built over time and allowed us to bring it into the project, even though we didn't really have that few hundred thousand dollars to do downscale modeling from the regional models. Uh, then moving forward, uh, so another piece of news that a lot of you might not know, if you follow the Twitter from Monmouth National University, you might know this story. A SCAT, uh, South Southwest Asia office is hosting a network, South Southwest Asia Network of Sustainable Development Goals. Short sums to make it easy for everyone to remember. This is a network of very uh, prominent, uh, important research institutions, uh, academia, think tank institutions that work on topics related to SDGs from different countries uh, in the South Southwest Asia. So all 10 countries are members. For example, um, um, I don't know, India Policy uh, Center or um, India Water Foundation or uh, they, they are many big institutions that are members and they work with the United Nations in different topics. They try to uh, advocate for SDGs with their government. Government, most of them have good, good relationship with their uh, country gover government. So they are really good connections uh, and have a strong partnership with us. So uh, the first time that I came for this, uh, the first stakeholder consultation, basically in October, uh, I got in touch with MNU because Maldives didn't have a member. It was a member country, but it did not have any member organization. So we approached Maldives National University. Uh, Shani Nels Dr. Adam at the time was the deputy vice chancellor. So she met, uh, met with me. She was very interested. We discussed about the potential of MNU joining. And MNU was uh, the first uh, institution that has joined from Maldives, uh, our newest member. And we had some meetings about, you know, the common areas of interest because, again, the whole purpose for this type of networks is to provide uh, exposure and to create collaboration and partnership. And climate change was a common topic that was an issue. It was an uh, important, uh, you know, uh, matter for Modern National University, uh, creating this master course on uh, environment and uh, climate studies. Uh, and in so many ways, because uh, the universities seem to be so connected to the uh, local communities, um, even in terms of you know translating the information and data into the BB and trying to make sure that that connection communication exists. So when the final uh, training was happening, I got in touch. We were like, okay, we want to have something that we can reach as many people as possible, but we don't have the money. <laughs> Again, it costs a lot, and modeling section is not a cheap country to hold events inside. Yeah, like some of the facilities, like even internet, like if you want to have something hybrid, it's really, really expensive. If you want to you wanna have a good quality kind of internet that uh, works for, you know, a hybrid AT. So then um, MNU uh, was interested. So we started this collaboration, looking at potential, potential locations that are relevant to the uh, findings that we had. We came up with like two locations outside the country. Then the workshop was started basically planning everything. So it was a really a strong partnership from the get-go, uh, from the staff side, from MNU side, doing all of the logistics. This was like one time that I was feeling really, really comfortable, uh, you know, knowing that I'm coming like late, I, I don't have to come one month in advance, but things are going to be ready because there was this kind of a strong correspondence and uh, you, you could feel that on the ground, things are under control. And this is something that I think like if we really didn't have this partnership, it would have been probably a 30, 40 people, one day event, no discussion, nothing much. We would try to reach out like probably hybrid like or you know online, but to what extent I don't know. Because one thing that I've realized in Maldives, if you're not on the ground, sometimes you have to run and run for like three months, four months to make like when a meeting happen because everybody is so busy. But when you 
you know, come here, everybody is so friendly and so supportive and they see you are here, okay, they try to accommodate you. In one day, you can manage something that like you worked on for like three, four months. And this brings me to the gap and challenge. I think the point that was mentioned at the beginning is really important from my experience here. Again, I have much less experience in the context of models compared to all of the other panelists here, but uh, human capital here is a really big issue. Like capacity in terms of technical capacity is a really, really big issue. Uh, when we wanted to hire our technical consultant, uh, Umar was helping us you know, uh, finding the very first person, for example, we had to go through two rounds of uh, advertisement because everybody that had the knowledge was already engaged with like two, three projects. Even the person that we managed to hire, he was already working actually before Models National University. So time like for those people that had the skills was very limited. And then for all of our consultants, we had to actually do some training so that they learn some of the basics that they didn't necessarily know about some of the aspects of climate change or using geospatial data or using QGIS and all of those stuff. So it was really challenging. And then you could see, I, I was getting some feedback from uh, one of the consultants that uh, he also had this license for uh, analyzing uh, environmental, like doing environmental assessment for uh, development. Uh, and he's like, was saying that it seems in Maldives, like 30 people, something like that have this license. And he was one of them. And he was telling me that after the project, because his level of knowledge about the available data and projections, and also you know how to do the mapping and all has increased so much that now he has a queue for like the number of projects that want him to do the or he gets all of the money because now he doesn't have to hire somebody to make his maps and all. And also his quality of maps are like really high, and he has like 10 people waiting for him to do this type of analysis. So there is a lot of demand, there is a lot of potential in different places, but the number of those technical people is really limited. And academia here is really a good kind of platform to allow that type of uh, you know, integration of the knowledge into the system. And again, like later on, we are having this project, we are having this discussion, what's the next step? Like, if I leave Maldives, if I leave Maldives tomorrow, like, does anybody from this group remember there is going to be a portal? I sure hope so, but how can we ensure, right? Hmm? <laughs> 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 so, NDMA is the body that we are hoping to have uh, as, you know, a uh, main body that really works on this project. MNU, their collaboration, their training, like when they are creating their work, their uh, basically uh, modules, if uh, there is training for the local councils, at all councils from the uh, NDMA side, if there's anything in those fronts, then it can go from, you know, the internal kind of channels and then starting kind of creating the ambassadors for the project and moving forward. So at the end of the day, I think that the collaboration connection it's really, really important, but um, yeah, to, to be able to really continue with this type of uh, work, we have to really think uh, hard uh, about how we can build up that technical capacity uh, in the country in a way that really can correspond to the needs of today's work in technology with all the aspects that are coming with, uh, you know, improved basically methods of development. Sorry, I talked to my mom. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Leila, for this uh, very comprehensive and very informative information that you have shared. As you have said, that we, uh, as a nation, lack the human capital and technical capacity in this field. So, uh, when it comes to technical capacity and human capital, and also, uh, Mike has mentioned that the primary level. We need to uh, pay attention on the education uh, young children about environmental education. And if, uh, when it comes to touch the education, we lack so uh, in the way of uh, university, since we are the still small national university, the tertiary institution. So, what is your perspective and what are your plans ahead in terms of this building the human capital and technical capacity? as well as building young people who will be contributing. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, yes, we're doing some. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, I 
think there is some thought we can do at the university. Um, and uh, our reason to, uh, so we, we have um, the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of international partners, um, UN agencies and different uh, organizations. So um, in terms of, we do get a lot of technical help and through this collaboration, um, so one reason, uh, one is we had a project with um, uh, four uh, European Union uh, uh, universities through this, uh, it was a Erasmus um, uh, funded project um, uh, on um, climate change, uh, specifically uh, building capacity for climate change. So, and through this project, uh, we developed this course on uh, digital science and climate change. So I think that this is a real good start in terms of spe specifically focusing on climate change. So I think, uh, you know, um, there's uh, no way how much we can stress how important uh, uh, this capacity is for the course. Um, so our course is designed um, in a way that is uh, multidisciplinary and it is attractive for people. Um, so we're not just going to be learning only, um, just gaining the knowledge. Um, it's also uh, field work, practical work, and um, uh, working with um, the community uh, and also research. <laughs> so I think um, this is um, this is just a beginning in terms of climate change. So I have starting this course is a, um, a, a way to uh, we can develop the capacity and then we can go on to develop um, research in terms of further postgraduate courses. So that's our next plan as well. Um, so we are in the process of developing master's courses in related fields. Um, and um, and uh, I think uh, um, the problem we have is although we have these um, courses, um, uh, it's still there is a lack of awareness about uh, opportunity, right? Uh, in terms of uh, when you have, um, uh, when you graduate from these courses, um, you know, there is a lot of opportunity. Like Lila said, you know, when you gain uh, knowledge uh, in this area, there is a lot of opportunities to contribute. Um, so I think it's, it's really important uh, uh, how we go about um, kind of selling our courses as well as reaching out to the students and um, you know, increasing us to get them. That's our challenge. And uh, you know, our, uh, not only climate change, we have um, courses on uh, environmental management, marine science. Um, these are also really important for the country and um, uh, conservation and um, ecology. And there are various uh, areas related to science, but the problem is, Still, these courses, um, you know, the students are not taking up these courses. So that's what we want to specifically uh, address. Question? How long did the process of creating the course take? Um, so um, uh, it was, um, I mean, um, three years uh, from the beginning. And it is a long process because when we come to the, uh, how we design our courses, first we have to identify an area so that is important for the country and that needs to be um, uh, developed. Uh, so then we consult um, uh, different stakeholders and gather the knowledge in terms of how we focus. So our course is really um, kind of tailored um, to the local context as well as the global. Um, so that's um, so that process take a, take a long time in terms of, and then we go through the, so especially it's very important our courses are um, you know, we, we, we take um, quality, quality assurance. Um, so, so for that, we, um, we make sure it is you know, um, approved by NQA and other uh, agencies as well. Um, so we are looking also at in, um, international agencies accreditation is also important. So that's why um, developing a course uh, takes a long time. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we are able to tap into a lot of College uh, in terms of technical help, um, so that our courses are um, benchmarked and also is in the same standard of international um, courses offered in other universities. Any other questions? 
So one of the things that I've been able to understand from what has been happening over the years is that I was in the 2000, around 2005, uh, the MAMP project helped develop the current uh, environment management program uh, that for the university runs. Over the years, you've seen extreme decline in number of young people who are interested who were interested in the part of that course. Um, and then looking at the master's course, you have a very small class as well. Um, I'm not sure about other environmental courses, but overall, there seems to be somehow lack of engagement of young people in these, these important courses. Um, and that needs to be something that we should really look at and focus and see how is it an issue of accessibility? Is it, is it an issue of quality? It's an issue of, uh, uh, I mean, it needs to be looked at. So we don't have, and it's also about uh, employability afterwards. So unless you become uh, an EIA consultant or a surveyor, is there no other um, application of your of studies uh, in the councils, for example, how many councils do have a dedicated uh, environment officer um, or a DRR officer, someone who could take up that uh, be employed after studying this? And are the, uh, uh, are the salaries uh, equal enough, or attractive enough for young people to really venture into that area? Sometimes what you see is that civil, uh, the civil servant salary cannot meet a lot of requirements in some of the uh, urban communities that they, they have to focus on income and then some of these highly trained technical people end up being um, uh, involved in businesses. Uh, one of the predominant uh, climate scientists in the country is now runs a tourism business, um, living matter of this, for example. And these are examples of why we are not able to retain good people, why, why what's, the, what's the challenge there? And I've actually learned from students about the quality of education that's been provided as well. So there needs to be an effort to increase the capacity of existing lecturers um, and, and keep them up to date, keep them more trained as well. So I think investment needs to be put into ensuring that the, the lecturers, the, 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 the educators who are responsible for this become uh, uh, more, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, are more attractive enough to teach the subject in a way, how they present, how they I have to communicate and all of that. So you may have to, you may have it um, as the educational qualification, but teaching requires you to be skilled as well. So sometimes I feel that uh, there is again um, a complex uh, issue around why we're not getting enough students, why our, our people don't, may, may not trust the system, and also about employability and confusion of how that looks like. So. <laughs> is this a comment? <laughs> yeah. um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, this is something we really need to. I mean, we have to be honest about, um, you know, um, in terms of quality. Yes, sure, we need to improve. Uh, there are many areas because I myself, in terms of my background, is microbiology. And, um, you know, sometimes we find it difficult. We don't have the lab facilities. And, um, you know, um, so sometimes the facilities and resources are lacking. That's also something that we need to improve. And uh, specifically in terms of uh, people who are skilled in this area is also um, very limited. So even when it comes to, uh, you know, trying to uh, um, develop a course and, if, uh, you know, we, we can develop the courses, but in terms of Making it feasible is also very something that we need to think about when we talk about bringing experts in that particular area. It is very difficult, but we are we are trying to address this um, through other means. Uh, we have to kind of be a bit creative when you know in terms of how we go. But the thing is, uh, we have a good collaboration. So we we, we our students are exposed to um, you know um, experts in different areas. Um, so even though we don't have the knowledge here in the world is, um, we through our collaboration, um, because now we have a network. Um, so when we developed the, uh, the climate change course, uh, we had um, uh, we have um, um, engagement with four universities. So their professors are able to actually deliver some of the lectures. So that's how we are developing our climate change course. 
So even though we we have like uh, in our department, uh, you know, our, um, our lectures are specialized in different <laughs> areas, but when it comes to highly specialized areas, and uh, you know, we, we do like that. So when it comes to that, we, this is how we go about it. And in terms of research projects, we try to attach our students with professors who are, so this is an example so in, in our course and masters in geospatial technologies. Uh, we are uh, collaborating with uh, Spain universities and there are four professors who, are, who will be uh, supervising our students. So, so we try to address those issues because of our limited resources, that's one way. And um, in terms of when we are designing our courses also uh, to ensure um, quality, um, uh, we try to um, find resources as well as um, we, we make sure uh, our courses are benchmarked. Um, so it is, uh, you know, um, following these guidelines, um, you know, our courses uh, are at the international level. So it is can be recognized by other institutes as well. Uh, so if you had a question. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, yes. Because uh, this, this thematic, otherwise it's uh, an idea of passion personally for me. Yeah. And since uh, space research as a sector is there, I'm just curious to see how the formal education structure can kind of be interwoven to kind of adapt and expose the students to the sector on mm -hmm. things like research expeditions, something like field trips and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, so, um, I mean, um, uh, our courses in marine science and environmental management we, uh, is designed in a way that students are able to um, go on field work and uh, you know, get hands-on activities and uh, also they do internship, those kind of ways. So we, we, we are to develop, so it's very important to have close collaboration. So let the student get an opportunity and uh, to do internship. So that's one way also we need. So, I think, I mean, um, so far my experience, I only joined the department three years ago, so I don't have much experience in terms of more living um, the education system here. But um, but I can say is, um, you know, students we have, um, uh, well, I mean, who have graduated from our program. So I asked the students uh, how they're doing and what uh, fields they went into. So far, all the students who graduated from our courses are um, employed and they are, um, you know, already contributing. Uh, so, so the, the, the demand is there and, um, you know, students are successful in actually getting jobs. Uh, and, um, you know, there are students who are going to further education and they are uh, recently one of our um, students who have graduated from environmental uh, as well as um, uh, science courses. Um, got a scholarship um, through um, um, UK government. So there are opportunities. So it's uh, my, my, my uh, observation so far is, um, I think it's reaching out to the students. Um, students are not aware of the opportunities. That's where I think, I think I mean, uh, in, in our case, we need to do um, a kind of innovative approaches in terms of how we can reach these students and, um, you know, um, you know, uh, give them information that there are career pathways available and they can. So I think as a science project, there's no um, straightforward, you, because you can tailor your career, you can go into, because my uh, background is from, uh, as a laboratory scientist and now I'm here. So it's, you know, like that, this, uh, uh, the education I got as in, uh, as time, it allowed me to be very creative and learn, and so you can, uh, you know, design your career, uh, how you go about it. So that's that's the thing because when you think about uh, becoming a doctor, it's very straightforward. Okay, you would do medicine, but in science, you can go from um, uh, regulation to project work and things like that. Okay, yeah. um, somewhat related question, but I guess to you as well. Um, when talking about climate change adaptation and the economic pathways that do exist, climate change and studying about it is one thing, but like figuring out economic activities and sectors that we can uh, be more resilient as well is part of the equation. I guess, uh, would you be able to speak on that a little bit? Or... So, so, actually, in this project, we have 
you know, to what extent you can really do some analysis on the impact depends on the data that you have. So I think data is one of the biggest wealth that the country can really have, right? Um, more data, disaggregated data that you have, you can make better predictions on what are the impacts and in terms of the loss or in terms of the gains from different types of models. So uh, we did some very general uh, kind of calculations on the level of exposure for agriculture, for um, urban area, for businesses. But if you have some of the projections, which is something that in a lot of developed countries, uh, basically they do it all the time to look at, you know, what is the uh, estimated amount of agriculture that you have, estimated value, how much is the expected uh, amount of uh, impact in terms of loss based on the climate change and other aspects. So actually, and kind of connecting this to that discussion, because I'm an econ major myself, and before joining UN, I used to teach uh, at the university, like I used to teach economics, and now I'm the intern coordinator for our office as well. So I'm dealing a lot with the students and this kind of topics. Um, I think in general, even if you talk about a doctor, like nowadays, there's no major that is a pure, like black and white, just one thing. Even if you are a doctor, you might end up working on like level of exposure to a specific type of disease. COVID, there was so much connection between, you know, uh, health outcomes and many, many other indicators. And like, there are a lot of fields for research and connecting is all about convergence of different type of knowledge that you have. And actually having more speciality, more uh, rather techniques, more than just you know thinking about one topic or another, uh, it allows you to be able to really work on different fields. My major was uh, applied microeconomics. So my research, like I have worked on migration, I have worked on managed market, Islamic managed market. And I have worked on uh, early childhood education, like very different kind of fields, but they're all under the umbrella of uh, social related topics and uh, right economics. So actually, sometimes people ask me, like, how is it economics? But like, it, it goes, a lot of them goes into, you know, the human capital, return to education. There are a lot of things that here gets interconnected. And then when you learn the methodologies, whether it's like economics or it's uh, environments, then you can do calculation, okay, you're doing an investment, what is the return to your uh, investment? Whether it's a student, you're like deciding whether you want to pay the money or you know not go to market and work and go for a master degree, then it's like rate of return to education or you want to put your money on an investment and a business or a portfolio. Like you can go into a lot of different fields, even GIS, all of this stuff kind of gives you a lot of flexibility. Our interns, when they come to our office, since we started this project, one of the things that 90% of them learn is QGIS because there is one way or another things that they can do. So like in the trade, like if you look at our maps that was created in the past few years, all of a sudden we have a lot of fancy maps with like trade routes and you know, so many information and detail that has added value into the quality of the research that we're doing with, your, with our students, with our partner, because it brings like a lot of more information into the body and then when they leave the office, uh, I, I would say that I haven't seen any of our um, interns that is, you know, staying at home looking for a job. They either get into good universities or um, if they want to go for higher education or they end up uh, getting the jobs. Data um, being possibly one of the most valuable resources. Um, at the moment, then, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there is a value associated with data locally when, when Attempting to input data into uh, the platform was that uh, an element? Do you think that was at play? Um, it's a challenge that maybe like uh, the data that has prevent, uh, like present to the private institutions and NGOs even like how the, is, has it become an element of fiction by not having a value associated with the data detail for data sharing? Not really. I think as long as it was in a format that the institutions thought that is helpful. In Maldives, at least, what I experienced, they were very open to provide the data. Uh, but again, like finding the data in the right format, in the right segregated level, that has been the biggest challenge. But um, like I haven't seen any institution that say we have this data, but we're not going to give it to you because you know it would cost money for us, or you know this is like making us worse. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I, I have a more questions. Yeah. 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 
So just two more questions and then we yeah. uh, push can go ahead. Okay. So I just since all of us are here, the stakeholders, many stakeholders. So I would like to ask what we could as a team as stakeholders do to strengthen the collaboration and what uh, measures we can take to ensure the sustainability. Okay, since I ended here, I kind of start and then <laughs> because I, I think the answer is actually more over there. But one thing that I just want to ask so you've been here, you listen to all this discussion, and you've got to know the data, you've got to know the tools. So, what I really hope is in the next month or two to hear back from different bodies, different groups about what type of data that you might have that you want to add to the portal through the interactive tool, or if there are ways that you think the portal is helpful, but you need help to figure out how to use it. For example, we had a discussion with agriculture, like how we have this projection, we have all this land use um, for agriculture, like how if there's planning, we can really use this information or if there's building coding, like how basically they have this projection data has to be translated. So that would, if, if you come and say that like, we wanna do this planning, we don't know how to use the data, then we can also start facilitating that connection between you and the organizations and technical people that can actually help with that aspect as well. So from this point, I think more than what we can do is about what you can do uh, to bring us your needs so that we can respond to that. So I think for me, uh, continuing the dialogue so that uh, the, the more we keep the dialogue going on, the more areas of collaboration that we would be able to, you know, agree and find and then continue continuously. So for me, I think that continued dialogue we tend to, you know, only meet uh, like-minded professionals in settings like this and so we tend to meet them um, in our everyday work. So I think um, going beyond these four goals and continuing the dialogue would, would help us strategize and improve um, areas of collaboration in the future. Um, for me, I think um, for the moment it's um, social economy, for the environment, for conservation, um, climate adaptation, all of these developmental aspects require coordinated effort that is ready at, 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 at right now doesn't look to be so coordinated enough. <laughs> we have multiple agencies, ministries that work on different aspects of, of, of these elements. We have authorities that are trying their best to uh, work on innovation and, and, and direction and work, but then we don't see a collaborated, coordinated body of, of, of engagement where it could um, help us to do overall long term sustainable um, planning. Like I mentioned earlier, we don't have an external climate education plan, that's so that's, that's a long term plan that we could work on. We are still stuck with the uh, five year strategic plans that would come up. Uh, we, we are hearing of a national development plan, but in, in, in the work of the National Development Bank previously as well. So it's, it's about how we uh, work uh, together with respective agencies, uh, ministries, civil society, local councils. Uh, uh, local councils now, they have the capacity um, and, and the thinking uh, around a lot of this. So the overall environment and climate governance mechanism needs to be looked at uh, and needs to be worked on uh, if we are to work towards a more resilient uh, model say in the long term. And, and that needs to happen now. And that needs to be informed by evidence uh, making uh, evidence and research. It does not, it should not be influenced by short term political gains and political aspirations. Uh, so this is the challenging and difficult thing to overcome but without that sort of, uh, without that sort of commitment and, and collaboration. I don't see the models in the next 50 years becoming resilient. And, and, uh, um, I'll try to answer from first from the perspective of this project, right? So I think for the sustainability, the long-term use of this, it's very important for us to um, remember that this is not the end step. This is an intermediate step before which we need to um, take this existing platform that has done a lot of the groundwork, but then localize it further, we need to personalize it. Um, I really like the examples you gave Omar on the specific use case of the uh, farm owner that, that is suffering. We need to make sure that these tools reach them in the manner that they understand. They should not even see the tools, they should see whatever they need to take the action. So, and, and that's where we can really help. 
um, by, by working with our partners and, and the team that we have, which, which we are also growing and, and trying to grow the capacity of. So that is really uh, an important step. Um, but just generally, because um, some of these questions do apply from a general modus perspective as well, uh, and tying to the previous conversation, I think the fundamental issue here isn't really about the operational aspects of education or the plans. It's, it's that I don't think we have a national identity that captures the imagination of the youth. Youth have nothing to look forward to, so therefore, no matter how much we throw at them, they're not going to really absorb it. And so there, there needs to be a fundamental conversation on um, what exactly are we heading towards as a nation. We can talk about you know, adaptation plans, we can talk about development plans, but if we don't talk about the aspirational plans, you, I don't think we can achieve any of these things. And so fundamentally, Mesro's perspective is really to capture the imagination. The satellites are a tool with which we try to achieve that. And so this conversation is really missing in the landscape, and we hope that this becomes um, a, a fundamental conversation that we, we try to address more and more. Um, yeah, just um, in terms of this project, I think um, there will really need further collaboration, and I think this is uh, a really great resource for the students and learn, uh, especially for the students who are doing um, related courses. And um, so, in terms of sustainability, um, have issues like um, uh, you know we have the courses, we need more students. So in terms of how we can continue on, um, you know, getting more students and keep on training future leaders, um, and then um, uh, we have to think about more innovative ways of teaching, so so that uh, you know, so that people are more attracted to this course, and uh, you know, even from the very beginning uh, at um, graduate level of uh, you know uh, exposing them to. Um, you know, um, internship by you know getting the work experience, uh, field work, and those kind of things, um, uh, and research, uh, being involved in research, and also um, to to be contributing to a, a bigger goal. So with uh, having long term research plans, so that when students come, they can uh, be uh, part of uh, part of it. So that it builds up on it, and then we have. Um, you know, one established area in this area of learning in climate change where we um, collect this uh, student work and we build up on it. And uh, so that's one way to kind of, you know, um, continue it um, in a sustainable way. So I think that's, that's the most important thing. And then um, lastly, I think uh, we need to, we need to, uh, you know, think about the societal needs. So we need to, as time goes, we need to, you know, uh, uh, change. Um, we need to make sure what we are offering is what what the country needs. Um, on that, I don't know. Do you want to add anything? Sorry. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Um, so for now, the questions from my side, that's all which I wanted to talk But I would like to offer to the audience and for the online members who are there. If you have any questions, that the members are here, we can. They don't have any questions for online, no. Okay. If we got most of the question during the discussion, uh, okay. the so, um, I think more or less we are here and uh, towards the end of the panel. So I would like to thank all of you for contributing. And we had a very insightful discussion here. So thank you so much for contributing. Thanks so much. Okay, so we are talking about partnership. Thank you, everybody.